All right. Well, life now. Thank you so much, DSA, for coming. <clears throat> I've lost my voice, but I wanted us to hold this conversation because uh, there were so many opinions about this. And um, people, uh, Africans, confusion uh, all around. People want to know uh, what's going on. I see a lot of people bring their spiritual perspective. A lot of people talk about racism and other stuff. So the question is, what we're going to address today is who should Africans support, Russia or Ukraine? So we are, the interview is going to be broken into three parts. First of all, we're going to look at the economic, the political implication of this crisis that is going on in Ukraine, how it will affect Africans, how it will affect black people all over, all over the world. And then we're going to look at the economic perspective, the implication economically, and then the moral perspective. So that's what we're going to do. I want to start this way. There's a, there's a, a normal, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, protocol or, or when people start, they say you should uh, uh, introduce yourself. But I want to say that uh, I won't ask you say this question. I will give him time to speak more about his uh, experience in Ukraine. But any person who is joining us for the first time, if you really want to know about DSA, you can go online, you know, research. He has written hundreds, and, or if not even close to a thousand book. The idea online, anything you want to know about him, his experience in Russia, his growth, his ministry in Ukraine, anything you want to know, you can go ahead, do your research. You will get to see a lot of information about him. He's also very accessible on Facebook. He's very accessible on Twitter and Instagram. He's present everywhere. His teachings are on YouTube. You can find them. You can read them. The books are there. Access to everything you want to know about DSA. But what I will start here is that I'm very conscious, DSA. I know I've watched all the interviews you've given about this subject. And one thing I kept thinking, I said, maybe this news media, they will pick your word eventually and uh, misquote it or they will misrepresent your idea uh, about what you think about this crisis. So they will say, oh, maybe Ukrainians will say, ah, okay, he has lived in our country. This is what he thinks about us. Or maybe the Russians will say, because you gave a very neutral background. Should I say? So right now, what would you like people to think is your position? First of all, before you answer that, I would like to know how you're doing right now. How is your family? And explain to us how you have been where you are right now. Because I, I know recently you had a very uh, a catastrophic experience. So explain to us how you are here right now, how you're feeling. Then we'll go ahead to know how you, what you think about this. Thank you so very much, Innocent. Uh, how am I feeling? I'm trying to get, I'm trying to adjust to a new lifestyle, a, a new uh, mentality. Uh, you know, is one thing for you, like you, where you are now, you are probably in your room. So it's one thing for you not to be in your room, not to be in your kitchen, not to be in your share, not to be, to just find yourself somewhere as a refugee. You know, it's, uh, it's like you are uprooted physically and replanted or put somewhere temporarily. So it takes a lot of adjustments. And your family? Same with my family. My family is safe, but that's not the most important thing. As long as there is life, there is hope. Okay. So how did you escape? How did you get to this place? How was the experience? I remember you didn't leave Ukraine. You were there when the war started. Yes, I had left Ukraine a week before the war. I was in France. Then, they actually, in France, people were telling me, actually, the government officials, uh, the, even at the border, uh, the customs were saying, hey, why don't you, there's going to be war. Why don't you stay behind? I said, no, I'm going back. Uh, my wife is there. My family is there. And even if there's going to be war, I'm going to be there. But I left eventually because I got information that uh, I was in the list of Putin, even though I knew that uh, before, that all close to 20 years now, I've been in the list of Putin as one of the people that uh, he had declared as personal non grata. Uh, but then if he was going to take over Ukraine, I was going to be one of the casualties. So somebody uh, up there asked me to quickly leave, and that's why I left. Wow. Wow. Wow, that's... So why would Putin want to kill you, though? Not, not uh, maybe not. Why, why were you in the list of the assassination? The list of the people to yeah. be assassinated. You know, his elimination might be 
assassination, it might be imprisonment, it might just to lower the influence. It's all about influence. If you okay. are somebody that is influential in the society and somebody else is coming to take over that society and you are left alone, either you are going to be compromised to begin to walk and side with the invade, invader, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, invader or you must be removed. Otherwise, your influence is going to be working against the person that is invading you. Okay. So it's not just me. It's all about people who are top influencers in the country. Okay, so they are targeting are top influencers. Yes, who are not going to be in support of what they are doing. But the influencers okay. who are in support of Russia, they, they will not be touched. Okay, okay. Yeah, that is true because they, they install some mayors. And another thing is that in my case, I was already in a bad book of Putin because uh, about 17 or 18 years ago, he banned me from coming to Russia. And the reason for that was because uh, we were growing, we were having so much influence in Ukraine that it, split, it spilled over to Russia so much that we were having hundreds of churches in Russia itself. And his, his argument was that I was bringing Western theology, Western kind of view, uh, uh, worldview. And when you make people free, then they cannot be under control anymore. When you free people, especially when you make people to be free in God, they lose fear of men. And mm. then they, 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 you cannot bully them anymore. So that position of liberating people, setting people free, is not a popular one with dictators because dictators want people to listen to them. But then mm. what we are doing is setting them free and setting people free from the influence of dictators. So you have to ban me. Hmm. Okay. W but why do you think Putin is obsessed with Ukraine, Crimea particularly? Why is he obsessed with Ukraine? What is the interest in this? No, uh, I would not say he's so obsessed with Ukraine as such. He's obsessed with Russia. And is obsessed with his security, his country's security, and his country's uh, yeah protection. So okay. anything that is going to stop that security is going to eliminate it. And Ukraine was going to uh, stand on the way of that security. Ukraine was going to be posing a danger to his country, and that's why it was going to rather stop Ukraine than for Ukraine to become a threat to his country. What kind of danger? Economic danger, security danger? What is it? What is the? It is security danger. The danger okay. is that is uh, Ukraine was cutting NATO, and Ukraine was actually uh, aspiring to join NATO. And once you join NATO, it means that the NATO military base will be stationed in your country in Ukraine, and NATO military base being stationed in Ukraine. It's like in the territory, it's as good as stationary uh, uh, offensive forces of NATO at the backyard of uh, Russia. That okay. is danger because Russia, if you know their history, they have been attacked all the time because they have the largest you know, land mass in the world and okay. one of the richest uh, territories in the world. So, you know, it was attacked in the First World War, it was attacked in the Second World War, it was attacked by Napoleon. It was everybody trying to overrun Russia. So they are so conscious about their uh, security. The same reason why every country is having a military. Why do, why do countries have military? Why do countries build nuclear weapons and nuclear defense systems? Because they don't want anybody to pose a threat to them. So the same thing here. So, but, but if Ukraine, if uh, NATO comes to Ukraine, it's as good as Ukraine, I mean, as uh, uh, Russia being defenseless. So they needed, a, they needed a buffer, a buffer area that would give the weapons of NATO at least 10 minutes before it flies, it reaches Moscow. So the system that the Russians have put in place is such that if under 10 to 15 minutes, Anything that is flying there, their system will be able to take it down before it destroys them. But if it's located in, in Ukraine, it will only take about five to seven minutes. They will not; their system will not be able to respond to any security threat. Wow! But people are saying that there are border countries 
with to Russia, who are also a member of NATO, for example? Or what would, why, what would Russia yeah. do about that? There are other border countries that are close to NATO, for, but there is, like, for example, those countries like the Baltic countries. Yes. Those countries, Baltic countries, they have a buffer. There is a, an area that is called uh, Collinsburg, or it used to be called Collinsburg, it's called Kaliningrad now. It's, it's, it's outside of Russia, but it's territory of Russia. So okay. Russia has stationed there is the military defense system to stop those threats coming from that area. But from Ukraine, is directly into the territory of in Russia. Okay. Another thing I, I understand is that Ukraine, uh, Russia need access to the Black Sea, fresh water, for, because they have a station, they have stationed their naval uh, system in, the, in Crimea, which is giving them direct access to the Black Sea. So to them, seeing NATO coming in, like getting so closer is like a, is a, is a huge threat for them. But do you think his invasion of Ukraine is justified? Uh, the, there is no justification to the invasion of any country. All okay. countries, there are, there are laws that are regulating relationship between countries. Uh, and one of the laws says that uh, any conflict between countries must be settled you know, peacefully. Yes. That's, that has been violated if you invade another country. Okay. Secondly, there is no justification for any military to enter and cross the border of any country without the invitation of that country. So hmm. that is another violation. And then to try to, to come in and then be destroying infrastructure and everything. So no matter the justification he has in his head, he is violating international laws and is violating the integrity and sovereignty of another country. So he might be having justifications if you think about it logically, but yes. to, the, to Ukraine and in, according to law, there will, there will never be justification. Hmm. Because he has given warnings already, he has written a letter two months ago, warning both NATO and Ukraine about the danger of NATO uh, coming, getting closer all the time. So uh, I think the people didn't listen to him and he decided to take a step forward and people were like, okay, uh, a lot of people, Africans particularly in some African countries, Central Africa, for example, they held, they held a massive rally giving support to Putin. And uh, people could say, okay, yeah, he, he has his justification. For example, like uh, what, what happened since 2014, they say that uh, uh, the Russian people living in the Donbass region, that almost they have lost le nothing less than 14 to 15,000 people that have been killed through militarization of that uh, region. So do you think, could that be a, another justification for him, for example? Yes, I would not use the word justification personally, but okay. I would use the word the pretext. and reasons, yes. Okay. So they are, they are not pretenses, they are reasons and arguments, yes. Uh, Putin and Russia have their own arguments and what they will use as justification. But okay. somebody, as somebody that is coming from Ukraine and that knows international position of this, that's why I would I say it's not, not justifiable whatever happened. But okay. on the other hand, uh, there are a lot of reasons, logical reasons, why mm. he did what he did. Number one uh, is to what you said about the uh, access to water. Yes, yeah. the access to water, that is one of the, is, is, is he needed that not for Russia as such, but for Crimea. The Crimea that he had been taking over from, from 2014. So that mm. Crimea, the water supply is coming from, the, uh, from, Russia, from Russia, from Ukraine. So that is the easiest water supply. But now they, they, have, they have water supply that's coming from Russia, but it's more expensive, it's too far. So the water supply from Black Sea, from that area will be easier to, for them and cheaper. So, but that is not a reason to invade. That is just one of the additional advantages. So okay. one of, some, some of his real reasons why he's invading, one, number one is for security. Is that NATO stance? Number two, uh, just like you have said just now, um, you, Ukraine people will not allow, they will never take this serious. And that is why there is also injustice in all of this. And um, Ukraine people, they don't pay attention to the fact that, yes, it is true. If you ask an ordinary Ukrainian now, they will tell you that it is propaganda that people are dying in the Russian speaking Donbass area. But it's true, people are dying. What happened was that that, that uh, uh, 
breakaway region, Donbass area, they wanted to leave Ukraine and no country, no free country will easily allow any part of its territory to leave like that. So mm. what Ukraine did is what normal countries would do. They send their military there. And what their military was doing, they said it's anti-terrorist uh, operation. So what, you, what Ukrainian military there was doing, there, it was attacking them, trying to bring them back to Ukraine by force. So in the, in the process, just like what Ukraine, Russia is doing against Ukraine now, there were a lot of destructions, there were a lot of uh, death, but Ukraine people don't even get to know about it. They don't even get to do it. The only thing they, will, they were being told in Ukraine is that uh, it is Russians that are coming to try to take their country. They want, the Ukrainians will not admit that those people there are Ukrainians, and they are Ukrainians. They will say, no, it's just uh, mercenaries that are coming from Russia. So that is one of the reasons why people who are living in that area, they are supporting Russia against Ukraine. And many of them are going to the military, in their own, to their own military, to fight Ukraine because they said their people are dying, and Ukraine people never even pay attention to it. Just even not just Ukraine people didn't pay attention. The world has not been reporting on that that people are dying over there. So that is another justification that is trying to protect those people in that area uh, and that to put an end to that death process. But 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 that that is also that is just one of the other reasons. The, another mm -hmm. reason itself is that there was what they used to call the Minsk Agreement. Minsk Agreement. That Minsk Agreement is an agreement that was signed by the president of Ukraine, the president of Russia, the president of France, and the president of Germany. And that agreement had, put, had a procedure and a laid down rules of how to resolve that conflict so that that area would be assimilated back to Ukraine uh, without the fight and everything. But Ukraine, Ukrainians re refused to adopt and adapt that those conditions because they are deadly for Ukraine. Ukrainians, uh, they see their country as a unitary country. But in that document that the former president signed with Ukraine, Ukrainian president, it, it says that they should have to give autonomy, to give autonomy to that Russian-speaking region. And uh, Ukrainians were trying to do everything not to do that because if any president does that in Ukraine, they will kill him in the street. And no parliament will even allow, will agree for it, I and mean, uh, vote for it. So for seven years, Ukrainians dodged it, dodged it, dodged it. Unfortunately, the world is not speaking about that. But that is another big reason why Putin, in his own eyes, is just uh, he, uh, he justifies his attack because he has waited for seven years, and in those seven mm -hmm. years, people are dying, up to fifteen thousand people. So you say, but you people never follow the prescriptions that were agreed on by the countries, even the countries that signed it, Germany and France, they are no more talking about it again, as if that never happened. So that is why you, uh, Putin says, okay, the world, the world uh, community is not reliable. You are not making Ukraine to do what they needed to do. And so I will just put, take power to my own, into, in my own hands. And that's why I will go there, secure the uh, independence of those countries, and you know, demilitarize Ukraine in such a way that Ukraine would never have the possibility to attack those nations anymore. Hey, the whole situation seems like everyone messed up, both the Russians, both the Ukrainians, both the Europeans, both the NATO and uh, the Western world. Because when you look at it, first of all, the agreement, first of all, the reasons for Putin, and uh, I want to know. Do you think this crisis will have been averted? For example, what Ukraine will have done to avert this crisis, for example? Was there any possibility? Oh, yes. There are a lot of possibilities in what Ukraine, Ukraine should have done to avert it. I spoke this in Ukraine. I spoke this to politicians, to leaders in the country. But, you know, Ukraine is a very powerful nation. And they want to do things in a way that... Uh, I think the politicians, Ukrainian politicians are to blame uh, a lot, but nobody is talking about that right now. Because the reason why they are not talking about that is because they think this is war time. So let's just face the enemy we have now, which is Putin and Russia. But one of the things that Russia, Ukraine should never have done is that Ukraine should never have insisted in going to NATO. The, you know, it's like when you are living with beside a lion, if you don't go and be poking the lion, or the deer and be tempted and be poking it and be 
you know, tempting it. So it's just like Canada now. When you look at Canada, it's, more, it's almost like it's the same thing like the US. And the reason is because they are living with a giant neighbor. So they will never do any policy decision that is against or calling the US. They are always careful. And the reason for that is because they know that they are living with this big brother. If they mess up, they will, they will not be there anymore. So that wisdom is what uh, Ukraine should have you know, adopted. And that is what Ukraine tried to do in the past. But you know, this, the last two uh, presidents that we had are the ones who changed that. Ukraine was always neutral. It was always a neutral government, I mean, uh, country. But now this new president just said they are young. They, they said, no, we are going to NATO. That is the, the first thing Ukraine should have avoided doing. The second thing that Ukraine should have done is that Ukraine should have agreed to that Minsk agreement. They should have signed it and give autonomy to this uh, other part of to this other part of uh, Ukraine that want to go away. They will not go away, at, but at least they will have autonomy. But the country will still be together. So another thing that Ukraine should have done, number three, is to have allowed two languages. But you know, and, and that is one of the Russian demand that because there are a lot of people who are Russian speaking. But you now went and made Ukrainian only as the only language that should be spoken in the country. So well, that is ending the feelings of people who are in that place. So they are also angry about that. So a lot of things that Ukraine politicians, Ukrainian politicians should have done, right? But they have, so a lot of them are populist. Nobody wants to do a decision that will make them to lose election. You know, so they don't want to take it. decisive and, come, and uh, very difficult decisions. So they went with the easy, easy path. And that is why it has landed them now. To please the people. Yes, because popular votes. Okay. Do you think that decision was not just to please the people, but to please the Western world, the EU and the US, for example? I am very sure that if the Western world had not assured Ukraine of the NATO support, they would never have done that. In fact, there are videos where you, a US congressman and US, even uh, the president now, before he was the president, they were saying, you are free. You can go and join NATO. We are going to support you. If Russia attacks, we are going to support you. What you, Ukraine was thinking is that you, you, NATO will come and send their military to fight for them. Now, Ukrainians uh, are very disappointed that you know, they are just giving them weapons and they go and fight yourself. That no NATO force is coming to fight for them. But they, that is what they thought. And that is one of the reasons why they are, uh, you know, now they are now saying, okay, maybe they are no more going to join NATO again because NATO didn't fulfill their expectation. But why are they fighting? Are they, do you think they will win the war? If they, if they can't win, why are they fighting? Ukraine, if you tell if Ukrainians, that is one of, if I, I'm, I am a Ukrainian, I have my house, I have everything there, I have my church, I have my people there. But if you suggest to Ukrainians that they will lose the war, they will, you will become their enemy. So they are thinking that they will win the war. But I am saying, why should you keep on fighting? Well, even if you are going to win the war, they would have destroyed your country at the end of the day. Is it not your country that they are destroying? Why don't you reach a compromise? Why don't you just stop? Why are you still fighting? But they said, no, we'll never give up. We don't want to live under Russia. So we are going to win. That is the problem. But I personally, if I, I, I was to take decision, I would have said, no, I will not fight. Let be, because every day you are fighting, you are losing people. Then you are crying that people are losing people. Every day you are fighting, the country is being destroyed. Then you are crying that your country is being destroyed. Are you not the one that you still fighting? If you don't fight, there will be no all those things. But people say, no, we've never compromised. And there are some areas in the country where the mayors and the uh, they have said, okay, Russians don't destroy the city, please. We are accepting the government, the, the new order. Okay, we are, we are okay. But those people are being regarded as traitors in Ukraine. Well, because so far, so far, Russia has lost $600 billion since the beginning of the world. People who are watching can Google this figure and see. And Ukraine stands to lose at least $2 billion from the second pipeline, the gas, uh, the, the, well, the Nord Stream 2 that Russia was trying to construct that we intend to lose all these things. This war is costly. Uh, malls, shopping malls have been bombarded. Um, uh, a lot of facilities, public facilities, airport, airplane, a lot of systems were all bombarded. And these are material stuff. 
nothing to be compared with the with the physical you know i i don't know if people will understand this what it means for you to leave your comfort zone to not take shower for days walking traumatized whether you you catch a bullet or maybe a bomb will drop on you and struggling to look for escape and go to another country where you be marginalized, where you live, your, you are a master of your own vicinity, but now you are you are you are forced to leave. I don't know if people understand this. Apparently, up to four million people are displaced right now, so it's a very huge, massive loss for Russia, massive loss for Ukraine. So the whole thing doesn't make sense to me. Why they keep fighting? I don't know if they think they are going to win. I don't know, but they keep reporting only positive news. They haven't reported any defeat in Ukraine. Uh, even in the last, there was a, they said that the Russians used a hypersonic missile the first time because uh, they were trying, they were, they, they, some of their bombs were, were not reaching the target that they wanted, so they used hypersonic missile. What do you think is the symbolism of them using the hypersonic missile? Is that a threat? No, the hypersonic missile, first of all, is to reach the uh, the ammunition uh, depot uh, where the things were deposited, where they were you know, <laughs> hidden. The ammunition were hidden in such a way that no bomb would be able to reach it. Uh, so hypersonic precision weapons were the only ones that could get there. And that is number one. Number two reason is that they were needed to prove to the world and uh, to America and NATO that they have that weapon. And that because NATO doesn't have that, America doesn't have that. They are the first to develop it. So they are uh, now using that as, a, as, as an argument to say, don't touch us. If you try to come near us or touch us, we will reach you. Because a hypersonic weapon like that will reach anyway, it will reach uh, London, America uh, easily. So that, you know, we have something, we have an edge over you. We have the kind of weapon that you don't even have. So it's a kind of signal as well. Because the West was denying that they have developed that. Russia have declared it that they have it, but they were denying that no, they don't have it. Russia but, and China, apparently, these are the only two countries that have it. Yes, China also has, is developing it, but they have not used it. Russia is the first country in the world to have be able to uh, use it. So would this be a game changer, for example, let's say this hypersonic missile has a capacity to launch a nuclear weapon. Do you think this would be a game changer? Are we seeing a possibility of a, of a nuclear war? I'm asking you this precisely because I panicked today. Well, before, I, before this interview time, I, I kept reading, I was researching, I was watching news. Since in the morning, I kept watching. And all I kept seeing was uh, they, they held a NATO, NATO meeting today. Uh, yesterday, today, and uh, uh, I'm not seeing any de-escalation process that they are doing. They are only increasing supply of arms to Ukraine. And I came back to him and said, why are they doing this? And the, 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 the NATO secretary said that they have pushed submarines. They have positioned them in a strategic position. I said, what, what was going on? Because this is like madness. What are they trying to do? Because what I'm seeing, I'm not seeing effort for them to de-escalate. All I'm seeing is Escalation, escalation. I, I see Zelensky, the, the president of Russia, of Ukraine, he will come out and say, okay, uh, Russia, please relax. So um, we're, not, we're, not going, we're going to be neutral. And then he will turn back to the EU and, say, and NATO and say, please supply arms, supply arms. I say, what game is this guy playing? Because you are trying to create a problem for yourself. And then again, Russia just announced today that they are not going to sell their, uh, their gas in, in any currency in, e, in Euro, for example that the Euro, Europe, Europeans must buy their gas. And this is very important because 40% of European gas import comes from Russia, 40, that is massive. That is like 350 billion cubic feet of gas that they are importing from Russia. Russia is giving them all these things at a cheaper price. Now, if Russia cut it, they don't have any alternative. They don't have, they, there are other countries that can supply them, but at a very expensive price. So I'm not seeing uh, the escalation. I'm only seeing escalation, escalation. Do you think there will be a possibility of a nuclear war? It's yes. not, it's, it's putting that mad enough. Yeah, uh, the, that is a possibility. Putin is not mad at all. People are saying he's mad and they are very, okay. very wrong. Uh, but the possibility of using nuclear weapon is real. 
And uh, if it's going to keep on escalating, that is my greatest fear. And I released a video yesterday or two days ago when I was saying that's my greatest fear, that we should pray that there will be no third world war. Because Russia, if the whole world uh, gather themselves against, against Russia, I mean, in terms of NATO and America, Russia cannot withstand them militarily. When they don't have the men, they don't have the population, there's no way Russia can win. But Russia will also not lose. Russia has said, and I've heard past, uh, President Putin himself say, instead of them losing, or instead of them you know, being humiliated as a nation, they would rather, so that they want, instead of, a, a, they, don't, they would not tolerate a world where there is no Russia there. Instead of a world that, where there is no Russia there, playing the leading role, then there will be no mm. war at all. And, and that is not because well, it's mad, but maybe people could call it madness, but it's just because of the pride. Say America will tell you the same thing. That rather than a world where there will be no America, there will be no, no war. That's why they are developing. What is pushing these countries to develop weapons that is capable of destroying the whole world? America mm. is doing it, Russia is doing it. Why? They, is, they can defend themselves, but they are still doing it. They know that the weapon can destroy the whole world 10 times or 100 times, 1,000 times. They are still doing more and more and more, you know, because of this pride. It is the pride of superpowers that, you know, so it's not just Putin. If, any, if America too is pushed on the corner, they will do the same thing. If you remember the Caribbean crisis, you know, when America... The Cuban crisis. Yeah, 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 Cuba, Caribbean crisis. When America was put in such a situation, they were also ready to destroy the whole world. You see, so uh, uh, but that is a real danger now because it, it, you know, countries like Poland are ready to enter the war if necessary. Uh, other countries in the in NATO, and if they do, NATO might be forced into it because Russia would not any country that interferes, Russia is going to attack them, and if it attacks one of the NATO countries, it's going to lead to third world war. Why, where is the position of Africa as it is right now? What should Africans do in this situation? I, I think we, it's going to affect Africa deeply because uh, Russia and Ukraine are the largest, some of the largest producers of wheat. You know, that is flour and uh, bread and things like that. A and lot pasta, of people, spaghetti, uh, yes, cornflakes. Yes. So, um, so a lot of things that are coming from Russia and Ukraine are going to be highly reduced. And if that happens, it's going to affect the full stop costs in all over the world. Then also gas, maybe not so much, but petroleum price is going to increase. And if petroleum prices increase, it will affect the price of every other thing in this world. So, but Nigeria is a little bit better off because thanks to uh, the fact that we are oil producing country, so we'll be able to manage better than other African countries. Nigeria also is better off thanks to a man called Dangote, Aliko Dangote, that has now, you know, you know built a huge fertilizer and uh, agro -pet petrochemical, uh, you know, industry in Nigeria that is one of the largest ones. So right now, even the evil Europe is begging him to sell to, to them, you know, to, to, to bail them out. So, but so it's going to be good for Nigeria, but a lot of African countries are going to suffer from that as a result of this. Even Nigeria itself, they, they are already experiencing some high cost of product as a result of this uh, war. This is very interesting because four to five years ago, the EU, Europe, they decided to cut off a, a, a sponsorship of uh, this very Dangote. He took loan from American banks. He took loan from uh, Nigerian banks and took loan from some European, even the party, the bank party bar, he took some loans from them. I think they gave him a billion dollars loan. But the EU were ferociously against the sponsorship of any gas expansion in Nigeria or in Africa. They don't want it. They say, we have a plan for a gas emission. We have a plan for uh, eco eco friendly uh, companies that they want to produce electric uh, uh, vehicles and all these things. So they stop the financing of any uh, fossil fuel development in the African continent. So some of the companies had setbacks. Right now, I saw it that they are now begging him. But the problem is that 
we don't have enough capacity to feed Europe. For example, this Dangote plant has the capacity to the Nigeria, for example, has at least 210 trillion cubic feet meters of gas. That is massive. That is huge with trillions. And the European capacity is at least by end of 2011, 2010, the, the highest consumption was 500 billion cubic feet per day. No, per annum. Then 36 uh, billion cubic feet per day. So 36 billion cubic feet for European consumption, but Nigeria, the Dangote uh, 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 complex, has only capacity for 3 billion in cubic feet, which is enough for West Africa uh, and super enough for Nigeria, uh, but at least not necessarily to feed Europe, between feeding to that their demand that they want. That they want. And uh, if I understand clearly right now, they are in the process of constructing two pipelines from northern Nigeria through Morocco, at least 4,500 kilometers. And there's another pipeline that is following the, the coast of Guinea. Uh, and in this pipeline, they are going down. But we can see that this capacity is not even enough, like 3 billion cubic feet uh, uh, of, of, uh, of gas to people that are consuming 36 uh, billion. How, how can that feed into the, how can you feed this massive beast that he has? There is a Nigerian politician that seems to have the foresight I don't know if he's going to win. I don't know if he's going to even win his own ticket uh, nomination. Uh, you know him, uh, the Bitunugu, Bola Tinugu. And what he said is that he's going to, his agenda, his main economic focus, one of the things he's going to do as a president is to make Nigeria a, a gas producing country, to become superpower in gas production and to compete with Russia and to produce as much as Russia is producing in gas. He said, forget about oil. He's not going to pay attention to oil. Oil is already forget. He said his focus will be to make Nigeria a giant, one of the number one producers of gas. You know, I've never seen any Nigerian politician talk like that, but he was very, mm. I listened to him, he spoke about that. So, and of course, one of the things we need to quickly do in Nigeria is to finish the construction of that pipeline to Morocco, to Morocco and the one through the, the Guinea uh, or something. So then uh, we also need to begin to now invest massively, just like we did in the 60s and 70s in the petroleum, to invest in gas. That way we might be able to become, even if we are not going to become the answer to Euro problem, but at least we'll be able to make a lot of money from Europe. Wow. Uh, is that an endorsement to Tenebo? We should ask, is that a campaign for him? No, no, uh, no. I want to see who we win. I mean, who will be the, uh, what do you call it, the card bearer, what, is it card bearer? Or who yes, and of the, APC. Yeah, for APC, and who is also going to be the candidate for PDP. So I want to see another parties who are going to be the uh, nomination, nomination candidates or nominated candidates. So it, it, it depends on who the, nominate, who the nominated candidates will be, who will be the card bearers. So if, if, uh, uh, Tinubu will be the card bearer for APC. Mm. I, I will have to see who will be the card bearer for PDP because those are the two parties that can win. So if if I will compare the two the two and see the advantages, the disadvantages, and then I will make my decision. Right now, I don't know. Okay, okay. That if if that's his plan, that is a, something very positive because Nigeria we, Nigeria has ten times gas more than the the fuel that we we, we have uh, so so i think that's a very positive thing to do now we have seen the economic aspect of this but what is the security africa has never been invaded by any foreign country are we going to be included let's say a war started during the second world war for example african countries were obliged to contribute militarily to the british and something happened something happened 10 days before russia invaded ukraine Something happened. People didn't uh, pay attention to what happened. Uh, um, uh, this, uh, our, what is his name? General Irabo, our highest military commander after the president, yeah. traveled to the Chief of Army Staff. Chief of Army Staff. He traveled to the UK. This is the first time in 30 years in the history of Nigeria we are, we, we were sending such delegates. He went to the UK with, with a convoy of all the military generals and the welcoming they gave in the ceremony with red carpet and the UK generals were waiting for him 10 days before Russia went into uh, Ukraine. So they have been sensing the danger that is coming up. 
So a lot of people were speculating. They say, ah, maybe they are preparing because Nigeria is a regional power in Africa that maybe, look, get ready. If Wala Day will call upon you to come and assist us. So, but what is the implication? Should the World War III start? What should African government do, for example, in terms of buffing up their security? Should we buy more aircraft? Should we just decide to set up anti-missile system? What, what, what should African leaders do? Uh, first of all, Nigeria should be neutral. Nigeria should not support uh, the West or UK or anything like that, or support Russia. I think Nigeria should be neutral. And uh, the neutral position is the winning position. Like, put being on the side of any one of them is making us to be a target. And um, to target Nigeria would be catastrophic because 200 million people. Even if one bomb falls in Nigeria, it's going to be disastrous. Now Ukraine is only 40 million people. I've seen the catastrophe that has already caused. Only 34 million people have left. <laughs> what about Nigeria? When millions, 20 million begin to leave, it will just flood the whole place and the whole world will be in crisis. So Nigeria should just right now that be no trouble. But you heard the comment, the U.S. Secretary of State said that African countries do not have, after the U.N. vote, he said that African countries don't have any choice. He said it, that they don't have any choice. Their sovereignty is suspended. They must obey U.S. and take a solid position. That was what he said. He said it yeah. only. Yeah, because America uh, is trying to bully the world. Um, even they are bullying even, for, even China. Even China is being bu 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 bullied. Top place of Africa, despite their, their might. So top place of uh, African countries, we are too weak. Uh, that's why we need to try to build ourselves up and be less dependent on these countries. Okay, so what do you think? What, what can you describe the next year, two years now? What can you say in three words? Are you pessimistic, optimistic, or realistic? And can you explain, pick any word and describe the future of humanity? If we survive this year and it doesn't end up in third world war, then I'm very going to be very, very happy. Uh, if Because the most critical thing is that this war will not escalate. If it doesn't escalate, then I'm, I'm uh, optimistic about the future of the world. Um, one of the things that Putin is fighting for is that the world will be poorer that the world will be uh, two-dimensional at least, or multi-dimensional. Bipolar, it's yeah. Bipolar, bipolar world, that's what he wants. He doesn't want a situation whereby uh, there is a, 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 a hegemony of, a hegemony, hegemony of uh, Western dominance, hegemony of US or Western values. So mm. that is one of the things he's fighting for. So in his own mind and in the mind of Russians, they are not fighting Ukraine. They are fighting that hegemony of Western dominance. So according to them, the, the, the war in Ukraine is against the whole NATO Western world because they feel that the people who are training Ukrainians are NATO officers. Uh, the, of, the NATO officers are the ones who are bringing, uh, the NATO countries are the ones supplying the weapons. Uh, and everything that really Russia is fighting all of them together because they are all contributing, they are all putting money, they are all, you know, America, everybody. So, and that is one of the things he wants to break. He doesn't like the fact that, uh, um, you know, what, the dem what, what people call New World Order. And even Biden was speaking about New World Order. That's good. There's going to be a New World Order and America is going to lead it. And that is what Russia doesn't want. It wants that countries should be free to determine their own destiny. That there shouldn't be a world whereby America will tell you what to do and by you mm -hmm. by force do it. For example, Putin is very much against the fact that you saying that a man could just come and claim that I'm a woman, and then you will go and so you, your toilet of men, I mean women, or go and do sports for women and. and you know, or, and people will say, yes, you don't have any choice. He said it's a woman, everybody has it all right. So Putin is also against the fact that we say traditional families are now the same as uh, gay families, that, uh, you know, if 
and everybody is equal. So he is saying, how can they, how can traditional family be equal? Even if you are going to allow other people to be there, let them be there, but they cannot be equal to standard. Mm -hmm. Or, for example, people who are straight cannot just be equal with those ones who are, even if other people want to be there, let them be there, but they cannot be equal and enjoy the same right benefits, getting the allowances from the government and having a right to adopt children and things like that. It's, it, it, it's also, so some of those things, I think, is saying that if you are a country, less African country, even European country, and you say you are not going to allow that, there is no country in Europe that can say they will not allow that. They will blackmail you or blackmail you. Or even in Africa, they, they will begin to remove their aid and help. And you cannot say, okay, I will not recognize uh, gay people, for example. If you say that, the, all the Western countries will begin to blackmail you. So those are the things that he is against. So to so say that he's mad, in his own mind, he has his own arguments and his own point that he's making. So he's not mad at all. He's one of the most logical human beings. He's a people you cannot understand Russian language. If you listen to him, mm -hmm. you, will, you will respect him because he is very, very logical, thoughtful, mm -hmm. thoughtful, thorough, clear thinking. Uh, the, the only problem is that he is putting also, uh, you know, the, with this attack of Russia, I mean, of Ukraine, uh, you know, we, we are the ones who are the victims. We are the ones who are the uh, who are suffering for. Okay, well, he cannot attack America for all those uh, hegemony of the West or the, mm -hmm. the back NATO, but he just was because he doesn't want NATO to come to his side. I mean, to his border. It's now Ukraine is attacking, and we are now suffering. So that is why Ukrainians will never understand or accept whatever logic he has. Okay, I think a lot of Christians, both in Africa. And Western world, people that are conservative, we agree with uh, uh, Russia on this. I, I have listened to the speech he gave, his justification. I listened to it in English three times. I listened to it in French, all the translation. And he had a very, 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 very solid argument, which I reason as, okay, this man is not mad after all. He's after the security, economic uh, uh, ground, uh, uh, development for his people. So I listen and I say, okay, he has some argument, you know. So we're getting close to the final uh, part of this program, but I still have two more questions to ask you, which I think are very, very, very important. I would like to hear what you think about this. Who do you think will win this war? Uh, who I think will win this war is a matter of my mind, of what I know in the natural a matter of uh, statistics and a matter of figures and information. But who I want to, be, to win this war is a matter of my heart. So in my heart, I want Ukraine to win uh, because they have all the support coming from the West and, and they have the willingness not to give up and to fight for their land. So that is my heart. But my head is telling me that we don't stand a chance. But there are a lot of consequences uh, if Ukraine loses this war. If Ukraine loses this war, I might not go back to Ukraine again. I might not see my home again. Uh, if Ukraine loses this war, Ukraine might be divided into two. Ukraine might end up being divided into two uh, or being annexed altogether. Uh, but if Ukraine wins this war, it's going to be a new, a new dynamics and a new future, bright future for Ukraine, even though... Well, how, how can they win? How can they win the war against Russia? Will Russia uh, accept to be defeated? First of all, Russia is only sending to Ukraine 200,000 warriors, uh, fighters. Uh, Ukraine has mobilized over 10 million people. As reserves, as people, not military people, but all men population are uh, not have been allowed to leave Ukraine. So over 10 million people have been registered. So even if it's just going to be by sheer number, and Ukraine, yeah, you, you, uh, Russia only has 200,000. So they are going to be having running to Ukrainians from the bush, from the houses, from everywhere, sabotaging their efforts. That is number one. Number two, even though NATO is not sending their own, official warriors or soldiers there, 
but NATO and all Western countries are supporting Ukraine. And they have people from over 20 countries in Ukraine fighting on the side of Ukraine. They have over 20,000 warriors or soldiers coming from NATO countries who are also yeah, in Ukraine, fighting on the side of Ukraine. So a lot of uh, factors are also on the side of Ukraine. So are we seeing the possibility of, of Ukrainians winning or yeah. Russia? Russia, Ukraine could win if it's, it's just going to be a conventional war, the way it is going now. You know, Russia is not using all its potential, all its might. And the reason why it cannot use all its might against Ukraine is because Russia is afraid of turning the whole of Ukraine against itself. Because it still wants to come and come as a deliverer of Ukraine as, as so that people will celebrate it and people will, it will be able to rule over them. But it's, so it's trying to be careful because if he just does the kind of war he did in Aleppo or in Syria, just wiping out, it doesn't take anything. You know, okay, for example, can you imagine right now, war is going on in Ukraine and they still have electricity. War is going on in Ukraine and they still have uh, internet. War is going on in Ukraine and they still have network. Not everywhere, but in most places. So mm -hmm. but what, what that means is that Russia, they still have water supply. What is happening, not in all places, but in most places, but because when, for example, America invaded Iraq, Iraq uh, or Afghanistan, immediately those are the first things to bomb. Communication, uh, supplies, and everything. But Russia is being careful not to do that because it's going to turn ordinary people against them. Secondly, that precision, that hypersonic uh, weapon that you bomb the depot of military depot, it doesn't take anything for them to use it to bomb this parliament or the presidential villa. They could take out the president immediately, take out the parliament, everything. Ukrainians will not agree with that. They will not tell you these things. They will just think, it's, you know, they will just think they are the ones who are strong, that, you know, that's why they are not doing it. But the guy could do it. But he's being careful also not to turn the wrath of the whole people that is going to, it's, because he's coming out trying to say he's liberating. Ukraine from the Western influence and liberating Ukraine from fascist influence. But right now, he will become fascist himself and the people themselves are going to be even much more against him. So, but there's nothing stopping him. But if he goes that way to fight the way they fought in Afghanistan or in Syria, then he's going to really obliterate the whole Ukraine. That way, <laughs> we don't have Ukraine doesn't have any chance. But if he's... Uh, if he's uh, going to be doing it the way they are fighting now, Ukraine has very, very good chance of winning. So, this is the second question. What do you think will happen for the war to end? Uh, for the war to end, either Russia has to lose a lot of its members, a lot of its uh, warriors, a lot of its fighters, uh, a lot of its soldiers, so much that the, the, the loss of men will, will be too much for him to bring in more people, then he will be forced to sit down to talk. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, if Ukraine will, be, will lose this war outright and the president or the parliament or the city of Kiev is captured, then the war will be ended. Because I don't think they will all agree to end this by, by discussion and by a negotiation. Yeah, no. mm -hmm. Because the conditions that the two of them are bringing out against one another, none of them will agree. Ukraine will not agree and Russia will not agree. Wow. Because uh, President Zelensky said he wants to talk to Russia, Putin, face to face. But after the speech I listened to, President Putin doesn't consider him as a legitimate president. He sees him as a thug, as a new Nazi. He doesn't even see him as a worthy opponent. So I'm not even sure if he will accept a one-on-one -on -one negotiation with him because President Putin is very detailed when it comes to symbolism, when it comes to meeting. Everything he does is very calculated. So him hosting President Zelensky will be like legitimizing him, you know, seeing him an equal on sitting down on the table to negotiate. I'm not sure Putin will accept that. I read something about, about what Putin said, what he wrote long time ago. And that reminded me of a statement you made when uh, Prophet T.B. Joshua died. 
You released a statement on Facebook, YouTube. You said he left his mark in history. I'm not sure any, any person that was listening to the audio you made understood what you said, but I understood what you, made, you, 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 you meant in that statement. So today we are speaking about Hitler, not necessarily because he was a good person, but he left his mark in history. The same thing with what Prophet T.B. Joshua did. Um, even though I don't support his ministry, I don't support his person, but up to a million people are coming to Nigeria annually contributing to the tourism sector in Nigeria just because of his church, people from South Africa, people from Brazil, Puerto Rico, from Cuba, the record that there, even our aviation ministry said all that. And the man is valued all over. He has built a castle. He is not... He doesn't have school education, but he has succeeded in building a castle for himself. If you see his edifice, the church he managed, you know, I, I manage some little group of people. I know how difficult it is for you to manage people. They will come with a lot of trauma, with a lot of uh, uh, sentiment. They will fight you here and there. But for you to have thousands of people under your control, what TV Joshua did by creating history, by building a church center, making sure the electricity is functioning, the AC, the mic in the church, the choir is functioning, protecting from rumors, from allegations, from insult, from all sorts of things is a massive thing. So he left his mark in history and Putin made a statement. Right now, I'm afraid we have, there's no going back. I feel like the man who wants to remember in history, he wants to probably die so that when historians are writing books tomorrow, they will write about him. Probably they will write about him as a man who started the third world war. This is my fear. After all the research I've done today, I was I started I started feeling fear. See, this man will not accept to lose. First of all, to be politically suicidal in his own country. His people might turn out against him because he presented his image of this strong, strong man, strong personality. He succeeded in helping Russia to come out of recession, uniting all the oligarchs in Russia. They are brutal. They are ruthless. But under Putin, he kept all of them under control. Some of them fear of assassination. So even his spice chief, he threatened him on live television, tried to disgrace him. So I see this mindset in him that he is determined to create history. He wants his name to be written in history of humanity, either as a man who gave Russia liberation or the man who stood. I feel he has been looking for this opportunity actually to stand against the Western system. Because when I listened to his speech, I could hear vendetta, strong argument. I could hear an unforgiving man that he, he feels he will never forgive the West, he will never forgive Russia the USSR for allowing themselves to be broken by the Western system. He wants to restore that glory. He wants to restore that system. So he is determined to create this history, which is the biggest danger that people are not paying attention to. People are thinking he's mad. They are thinking he's this, but I feel like, do you think this is a possibility? No, he doesn't want to become, remember, he doesn't want to be remembered like Hitler. He wants to be remembered as somebody that changed the world order. Somebody that stopped, put an end to the one, do, one nation domination of the world. He wants to be the country that allows smaller, weaker nations to be free to express themselves. And, uh, but, but through stopping the Western influence and expansion. expansion. And, mm. but, but most importantly, he wants to be free he wants to be remembered as a country that made Russia great again. Well, okay. This is the, the this is my final question, and uh, uh, the, this is the last one, so that we, we end it. It's getting too long um, because right now we're seeing the position of China. Um, because I know that China has similar situation with Taiwan. They have been waiting patiently to take over Taiwan. So right now, I feel like uh, Russia is just a demo for them. They are watching and learning. It's small Russia. As Nigerian people say, Sponja is shaking the whole Western system. If China, as huge as China is, they will shake the whole Western economy. What do you think is the position of China in this situation right now? Do you think China will support the West or they will support Russia? Of course, they will support Russia. They are partners with Russia. Only they are not coming out outright to say that. But they are on the side of Russia. Secondly, uh, they, will not, they would like to do what Russia is doing in Ukraine, in Taiwan. But they stand a, they cannot do it now. 
they will still need more time. They will need another 10, 20 years before they can do that. Because awesome. right now, there is a contract, there is a, a treaty existing between Taiwan and U.S. That, so you, Taiwan is under the protection of U.S. That if anybody attacks uh, Taiwan, it will be as an attack on U.S. So it's a big difference from the one of Ukraine. Okay. Okay. So probably Taiwan is more prepared uh, than the, the Ukraine. Probably they are being buying ammunition from the U.S. And I, I can imagine, uh, let's say right now, right now, the U.S. are threatening China to either side with them. Uh, they are even blackmailing China, uh, all sort of blackmail and anything. So what is your final word before we, we, we close? Well, what is your final word? Uh, my final word is that we should believe less Western media and, uh, and consume less Western media. We should do our, more of our own research. I like the way you said you were able to listen to Putin in French and English and translation. But most people don't go to listen to people speak direct. They just listen to the comments of journalists. But when I listen to the comments of journalists, Western journalists, they have an agenda. They are working to promote the one singular story of one that hegemony of Western opinion. So this is like uh, the movies in America. The movies in America always have, to have good guy and bad guy. So that is black and white. You know, either is at the black, the good guy always wins. And the bad guys, they always demonize. You have to demonize one to make another one look angelic. So that is what is going on. That's what you are seeing in the media also. The, the, you know, the Putin is the bad guy, but it's not so straightforward like that. Ukraine is a good guy, and uh, Zelensky is the hero. And so anything, doesn't matter, nothing good could ever be good if it come out of Russia or from Putin. Or, or you know, so it's always evil. But if you follow that narrative, you'll be deceived. And by the time you get to know the truth, you might not forgive yourself. Hmm. Okay, so people should open their mind, if I understand. Make more research from the... Do, do more research, read widely, do your own research, go to the source of information, and then try to maintain uh, a balanced view by looking for truth in all that. And Africans should also not take position in the war. We should remain neutral and not be blackmailed into voting or sidelining. Yes, the government can be able to be blackmailed to vote against, but the populations are the people who, obviously, if you read from the comment, from the commentary made on online, Africans are not interested in what is happening in Ukraine. They have their racism, some of them say racism, for example, they accuse Ukrainian of being racist, that they denied African student boarding uh, the, the, the train in Ukraine. It's very sad we have to end, but these are some of the concerns coming from Africans, and they are enjoying the support from the Russians uh, military-wise in Africa, and uh, they are tired of the Western hypocrite, uh, for example. So all these things are concerns, all these things are elements. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, thank you for all our viewers. Please go ahead, do your research, and uh, go search for Dr. Sandy Adelaja with so many interesting books he has written. And uh, thank you so much for your time. But let me steal this from you before I let you go. When do you think it will be possible for you to go to Nigeria? Because I know you have a mass plan for Nigeria. I can't wait for the day you say, yes, you're going to Nigeria. In short, me, daddy, I'm packing my bag. I'm going to join you here. Yes, uh, my Nigeria is my ultimate goal, ultimate uh, destination. Uh, but right now, I have to try to regain my feet here because I have all my children here in Europe. Okay. And uh, so uh, I need to get my, my foot in and be able to put them somewhere, gather them together again as a home and, uh, you know, station them or get get my, yeah, get a home for them before okay. going back to Nigeria, finally. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, DSC. Thank you for your time. And uh, see you next time. Thank you. All right. Bye. Pleasure.